It is 9.04. It is Wednesday, May 5th. It is Cinco de Mayo. I don't know if we have any May 5th babies on here. I know we just said um, happy birthday to everyone in the month of May, but we just wanted to shout that out. Um, uh, and so thank you for joining us today. My name is Shelly Willis. I am the master facilitator for this group that meets and convenes every month on the first Wednesday of every month to really talk about community impact uh, under multiple uh, areas. And uh, there's a lot of work going on here. And so we just wanna thank you for joining us. We wanna thank you uh, for bringing your good energy. Uh, for those of you who have your cameras on, I just wanna say again, thank you for bringing all of that light in, that light just exudes through the screen and it feeds energy into everyone else. So if you wanna share what kind of light you have going on in the back, let us know, let us see. But we just wanna thank you for joining us for our Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force May meeting. And I just wanna kick it off by making sure that we, uh, one, go ahead and fire up the chat. If it's your first time joining us for a Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force meeting, uh, make sure that you let us know it's your first time in that. Uh, light up the chat, put your introductions in the chat, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Let us know who you are. Today, we have a great uh, agenda for you today. We have a uh, lineup of great presenters today, and we are uh, doing a, a part four of our Lens Inequity series. So you have a lot of good information, a lot of good sharing that is going to happen this morning. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this month is, uh, this month is uh, our Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And just reading a little bit from the president's proclamation, um, that Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders make our nation more vibrant through diversity of cultures, languages, and religions. There is no single story or experience, but rather a diversity of contributions that enrich America's culture and society and strengthen the United States role as a global leader. The American story as we know it would be impossible without the strength and contributions and legacies of our AAN, AAN of our American Asian of our Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander heritage, um, who have helped build and unite this country in each successive generation, from laying railroad tracks, tiling fields, and starting businesses to caring for our loved ones and honorably serving our nation in uniform. These communities are deep, deeply rooted in the history of the United States. And so we also celebrate and honor, honor the invaluable contributions of our of these communities. That, have made to, that they have made to our nation's culture in the arts, law, science, and technology, sports, and public services, including the courageous, um, in, including the courageous of ones who have served in the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic as health care providers, first responders, teachers, and other essential workers. Excuse my choppy reading today. It's all looking blurry. So we want to celebrate and make sure that you know that we want to honor and celebrate and give call to our Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, we want to just recognize that and make sure that you know that we recognize you as a culture, we recognize you as our people and the contributions that you have made to make our nation and our country and our world so great. Excuse my reading, uh, trying to read it and it's all blurry, but yes, I wanted to make sure that we recognize that and we call that out this month in celebration. So thank you so much. And I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Shelley. All right, so let's read our land acknowledgement. Uh, we pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also express our respect for all other, all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Pierce County home. These are original homelands of the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin, Stillicum, and Muckleshoot. It is important to move beyond acknowledgement and reflect on your own history that brought you to this place. This land acknowledgement is one small step in an ongoing commitment to improve our support of indigenous communities in the area. Thank you. And we'll, we'll roll right into a quick announcement. Um, so we used to do these presentations at the, at the task force where we'd have our partners come in and talk about programs, uh, whether it's new or existing, um, and just kind of give a highlight and help try to figure out how to support them. Um, and with the lens of equity, we haven't been able to do that as much. So Tamar and I started a, uh, a series called The Corner. 
Um, it's something we've talked about for a long time. And basically we are starting to do interviews uh, via Zoom. We hope to do them live uh, and turn them into podcasts at some point. But it's really just to highlight our partners, everybody that's in the task force, um, different programs, uh, and just really trying to keep, keep that going and understand how to support them and just grow together. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that we recorded our very first one. I think Jen, yep, Jen Robbins is on the call from Help Kitchen. She is here. Uh, we just recorded it, but we want to just make an announcement. Keep an eye out for the recording, um, and there's going to be more information. We have a special Q&A. We're going to do that again. Um, that's coming up on Thursday, the 20th at, uh, at 11 o'clock. And so we'll put more information about that. We just wanted to give you a, a heads up to keep, be on the lookout and uh, should be good. And I'll turn it over to Tamar. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, man, just such amazing power in the room and I always love it. For those, if it's your first time, if it's your second time, if you've been here since the beginning, man, the task force has... You know, honestly, it it started out as a unit and truly it's become a family. Um, I've realized over the last year that <clears throat> a lot of this work we can't do without each other. And I've been blessed to be in, in, in the same room as every last one of you guys. I know we've gone through ups and downs. We've been through COVID. But this has become a family. This is a place that you come to feel safe. This is a place that you come when there's something on your mind and you just have so much on your plate that you cannot do it alone. We have so many people in here that are on the same mission, same journey and carry the same values and passion that you guys do. So it's easy for us to get this work done. You know, the commonality in the task force is the community. It's the most important thing to every last one of us. It doesn't matter our titles, our roles and what we do. We are all community citizens. We are all part of Pierce County, King County, and the rest of Washington, hopefully the globe at some point. But, you know, you guys have become an important piece to the work that we all do, each and every one of you. If you get to look at your screen, please look left and right, because those are your partners, those are your colleagues, those are your friends. And we're going to continue to move and make this thing happen, because it's what we do. And we're bred for this. I know that a lot of the mental things have gone on, but from myself to every last one of you guys understand that the work does not make you, we make this work and we make it look damn good. So let's keep going. It's gonna be an amazing, beautiful day today. Applaud every last one of you guys for being here. Again, if it is your first time, welcome to an amazing, beautiful family. And I hope to see you guys again and we'll be talking soon. All right, thank you so much. So now let's kick it off. We're just gonna shift. Right now we have some quick updates from our people's group, then next uh, outreach after outreach organization structures. And then we will do an uh, official introduction of a new staff member here at Workforce Central, Chloe. So I will kick it off to whomever is representing the people's group this morning. Good morning. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda. If you don't know me, co-leader for the People's Group. Um, this month for the Speakers Bureau, everything is just kind of running smoothly. We have our speakers working the program right now, a couple getting ready, getting pictures sorted. But the exciting news is that our donation link is now live and I will go ahead and put that in the chat. And um, we're still working on a couple of other grants um, that Garrett found for us. So we'll see how that goes. And Education Pods is really starting to move now. We got all the information we needed from Bates Technical College and, our, and that's being presented to Arlington House. And uh, we'll see if they're ready to pick up our pilot project. And then Jeff, you wanna do the update for I-5 Thrive? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot to speak of since last month. Uh, we're still just trying to figure out our first moves. Um, I know Yvette has been working really hard on kind of mapping out the workforce uh, system and all the different partners and really trying to make a nice visual map so that everybody can see where the different pieces fit in um, because not a lot of people are familiar with that. And so when you start talking about all the different pieces, it gets pretty uh, confusing, but that's gonna really help us kind of move forward. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Go ahead, 
Good morning, everyone. Courtney Acoff with Outreach. Um, same as Jeff, we don't have a lot to share from last month's meeting other than the fact that we are now focusing on collaboration for a cause 4.0. And I know that's moving fast, but we really wanna to try to get the ball rolling on this event, uh, the sooner the better, so that we can start marketing that and targeting a specific audience um, at, a, at an earlier time than we did with collaboration for a cause 3.0. Um, Tim is really focusing on membership messaging, just making sure that all of our new members are getting consistent messaging and that they understand why they're joining the group and then Kelly has been gone for a while, but she is actually joining us pretty soon and she's ready to knock 4.0 out and bring all of our partners on. So anyone that's interested in supporting our outreach events that have not interest, um, supported in the past, feel free to contact myself um, or Kelly Blucher with the Goodwill Company. Thank you. And hi, I'm Cindy Caldwell with Organizational Structures. Uh, Carissa is out with a sinus headache, poor baby. Um, we have decided as a group, as leadership, that we're going to postpone our summit that was going to be in June to 2022. We just found that we had so much rich, fabulous material and concepts that we just didn't have all of all the time to really prepare that the way we wanted to and to put it into the kind of depth uh, that we wanted to bring to y'all and the quality that we wanted to do it with. So we're still going to be bringing some fantastic um, presentations and topics to you. We're hoping in June to do some um, serious work on mental health um, presentation. July, we're going to be doing uh, still working with our gold standard onboarding practice. We're going to be having Deborah Howell, who is the CFO of Workforce Central, and Lori Harnick, who's the CEO of Goodwill, um, do a presentation about their gold standard onboarding. And those two organizations are just on fire, right? They're just doing such good in-depth, continuous work. They're, they're, they are not interested in a one and done. They are absolutely doing continuous work strong work and really setting a wonderful example for our community to be able to follow. So they'll be doing that, we hope in July, and then perhaps in August. Um, I have a social worker friend, social worker friend, <laughs> whose name is Jarrell Sanders, and the police called him one day to help de-escalate a situation. He went in and did de-escalate, was successful, and there were no shots fired. And so we're hoping that perhaps he will be giving um, a description of what happened and possible future work with the police um, in some sort of conversation around that. Perhaps that will happen in August. All of these um, things have to be firmed up, but those are some of our ideas and topics that we're hoping to bring to the task force meetings. And if you have ideas for us, please um, let me know. You can reach out to me or to Carissa, and I'll put both of our emails in the chat again. All right. Um, tomorrow's yours. All right, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure for me to announce a new team member that has joined Workforce Central with us. She is a program admin, but you know, she's a team member to us. So I want to introduce you guys real quick to Chloe. She is amazing at what she does and very happy to have her on the first meeting with us today. Hi, Tamara. Thanks so much. So, um, yeah, it's great to be here. I just joined Workforce Central as a program assistant about three weeks ago. Um, a little bit more about me. I'm a recent grad from PLU. I'm really passionate about public service. I knew that I wanted to have some kind of position where I could give back to my community and help serve. And so I am just so thrilled to be a part of this team and, you know, being able to be a part of all of this. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much, Tamar, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, no, I was saying thank you, Chloe. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Lawrence, kick it off. It is time for our Lens of Equity mini series part four promotion. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Shelly. So this series is coming to a close with the idea of promotion or well, the concept of promotion. And I want to provide some clarity about when we talk about promotion, what are we actually referring to? Uh, yes, we're referring to how promotions work within an organization, but more specifically, what we're talking about 
is the internal and external communication of how DEI work is being shared and how it's being practiced. And so we've got amazing group of women who are going to share um, their stories and their insights. And I want you to take away four things in regards to how do we communicate DEI work? What is the posture, the disposition uh, that we should have as we invite people into our journey? And these four things you're going to see from, from these ladies. One, you're going to see a sense of transparency. Two, you're going to see a sense of cultural humility, meaning that there's a learner's posture to say no one has it completely figured out. Three, there's going to be a commitment and accountability. And then four, you're going to hear about hope, hopeful expectations. And so as we conclude this series and talk about kind of the amazing things that are going on in our county, I'm excited to acknowledge these um, three different organizations, which are Pierce County Library, Lister Elementary, and we also have Metro Parks. And when we think about how this journey started, this started with people. When we think about DEI work, we have to center our attention on the people who have historically have been impacted the most. That's how our practice get formed. That's how our policies get instituted. And that's what we promote. And when I think about people and I think about this group, I think about when we started back in October. And I think about the, all the changes and the tough conversations and the honesty that had happened in the last six to seven months. And so I just wanna take a moment to say, thank you ladies for the work, the dedication. Another part of this is the risk. One of the things that, that I, I really hope people capture in regards to when we have to do this work, it comes with a level of risk because we have to say things, we have to point to things, we have to put a flashlight on things that oftentimes are uncomfortable, they're uncertain, and we're not sure how people are going to respond. And what I have seen from all of these women is that they have put the community, they have put the interests of the voiceless in front of their own. And these are the same women that are mothers who have families that they have to take care of, partners and spouses they have to support, and a number of other things that are part of their commitments of the things that they have to kind of account for in life. And yet they're taking a moment to say, this is what I'm willing to risk because our community needs it, our respective organizations need it, and more importantly, our country needs it. And so I want to say happy Mother's Day to you all. Um, just your grit and your determination and your honesty about how hard this is and how tired it is sometimes and how um, the support oftentimes about, and I'm gonna be really specific about the times when no one really has your back and you're standing alone and you're wondering if this is worth it. And I just want all everyone, if we could just gather to give a warm welcome to these amazing women who have said it's worth it. And so first up, Pierce County Library, Jamie and Christina. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jamie Prothro. I'm currently the Customer Experience Director at Pierce County Library. I've worked with this organization for about eight and a half years, but I've worked in public libraries since I was 18, and I actually had to do a little bit of math. It's one year more than a quarter of a century. I um, was drawn to libraries specifically because of the freedom of everything that happened inside of the texts and the worlds that can be um, explored, especially when you come from a small town in Kansas like I did. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just point out in, in kind of an introduction to me and my point of view is um, there was the, the American Library Association has a number of resources and kind of fundamentals within um, its 
it's thinking and body of work. And there's one specific area called the freedom to read that, that got me early on. And I thought I would just kind of read this and let Christina then introduce herself and then we'll get into the presentation. But in, in the center of, of my heart and being, um, it's the responsibility of the librarian to give full meaning to the freedom to read by providing books that enrich the quality and diversity of thought and expression. By the, ex by the exercise of this affirmative responsibility, librarians can demonstrate that the answer to a bad book is a good one. The answer to a bad idea is a good one. So those, um, that's resounded in my, um, the way that I work um, and um, what carries me forward. Christina? Hi there, I'm Christina Sinchon. I've been the facilities manager at Pierce County Library System for about three years. Um, I'm a social worker turned leader, operations manager, project manager, and everything in between. Um, what I'm really passionate about is making sure that I'm creating safe and inclusive physical and emotional spaces for both our staff and the public. Um, and so this work is really important to me. Um, for both of those reasons, and um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Great. So um, in 2016, the library system um, held an all staff day. Um, it was really intended to launch our strategic plan. We hadn't had one in a significant amount of time. We also hadn't gotten together as an entire organization for maybe about six years. And the time that they had, it was because of the recession and there was a lot of um, organizational change that was underway in order to reduce budgets. So this group um, that I was a part of, our first leadership team cohort, um, got to plan the, the entire day um, with the guide of sparking success and sparking success for all community members. Um, from babies to retirees um, and knowing that um, people walk different journeys, people have different needs and how can we um, really stop working in silos between youth and adult services and um, commit towards caring for the whole person through their entire journey. Um, we, have, we have some core service that we provide. So thinking about equity and inclusion in our spaces through our diverse collections and the investment from taxpayers um, to be able to provide that good idea through a book. Um, um, we have a significant amount of energy into programs and initiatives, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those, but we can't do it without um, partnerships. And so the library um, has been and continues to be strong partners for organizations to be able to reach um, <sighs> anyone. Um, our technology too and staff, those are um, our core services. But one of the things that um, I want to kind of give a little context at this point too, I think in when we met in 2016, we had been without email for about two months. Um, our servers were unhealthy. Our spaces hadn't been remodeled in a while. Our collections um, were, were happening, but our circulation was dropping. Our programs and initiatives were um, really scattershot and um, our staff um, were perhaps not as supported through training and development as they could be. But through some community engagement work, we developed our strategic plan that centers around three initiative areas um, of learning, enjoyment, and community. From that in-service day, um, we asked our staff, like, what, what was the big thing that happened um, as a result of, of spending the time together? And I wanted to show you all this word cloud of the evaluation that we got. There are some really key words and concepts that I, I don't see in there related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so for me as a library leader, this began um, kind of a, an interesting journey that hasn't been perfect at all. I have screwed up left and right, up and down, um, and each time I've grappled and I've come back with a bit more um, grit because um, this is the important work, but we can see that um, 
fun and learning and the day. And so we hit the mark in some ways of bringing together culture. And um, on this particular day, we had um, worked with an author, Shola Richards, who um, was really um, describing how to build workplace culture um, through the South African um, concept of Ubuntu um, about going together. And that was something that I carry with me today that because I do, I have a bias for action. I want to get stuff done, keep the plate spinning, keep moving, moving. There's so much work to do, but we have to do it together. Cultural change means that we have to be linked arm, arm to arm. And so um, since 2016, um, the library has um, done a lot of work um, that in some ways has been incredibly impactful. In other ways, our staff are questioning um, our urgency, but in order to go together, we've had to be a bit meticulous um, because there's all sorts of ways that we could go sideways. Um, so we developed a five-year diversity and inclusion plan. Notice that the words equity and even anti-racism isn't included, um, but that plan actually um, started with an EEO assessment with some recommendations for how we can recruit stronger, Public libraries, they're populated and employed by um, a not, not a diverse workforce. Um, primarily women um, requires a master's degree, which is unattainable for a number of community members or individuals who don't want to work in the library. But this assessment actually helped us build a plan and a strategy that would carry us for five years. We're about at the conclusion, um, which then means another, another phase of journey. Um, Part of what we did in this plan was to introduce a respectful and inclusive workplace training. We hadn't had something like that in, in the mix for a while. And um, we've completely revamped our hiring processes um, where we've been able to eliminate a lot of bias um, and make sure that our job descriptions um, have really current job titles with updated minimum requirements. and. Um, I think that that process has been, um, it's, it's been working in a lot of ways as we're seeing um, change in, in our workplace um, makeup. I think um, our job descriptions I just mentioned, but there's also an, a gender um, transition support process that the library introduced as part of this plan. In addition, we've been updating policies and right now we're in the process of assessing our current EDI work with a consultant. Also during the last five years, um, we had to go out for a levy reauthorization um, and we barely passed. We won that levy reauthorization by a mere 911 votes, which as someone who um, is directing the largest group of staff in the library, it was really, really um, sad to see that um, our and the public's commitment to how strong a library can make a strong community. So we needed to do something a little different. And so we've reorganized um, our public services department um, in order to ensure that there's some community work um, that's underway. I guess in 2017 to the library um, signed on to the urban library statement on social and racial equity, which is about eliminating barriers and services and policies. One thing that I was able to do as a result of that in our budget process was to include um, general fund budgets for each of our branches. We serve um, throughout Pierce County, except for Tacoma and Puyallup, so unincorporated rural suburban um, county. And each library has its own Friends of the Library group who raise money for um, supporting the library and above and beyond means. We were relying on the Friends to be able to provide program dollars so that we could engage community in one of those strong service arms. It wasn't equitable. Our Fife Library, where they're serving significantly diverse population, had one single friend. Whereas our Lakewood Library annually was bringing in over 40 to $50,000. Um, so we now have an equitable playing field for being able to provide programming. Um, I think also one, 
really important piece too is with 20 service outlets and a bookmobile service, we needed to develop some systems strong thinking because we're all in alignment to learning, enjoyment, and community. So a couple of things that I wanted to point out with regard to our reorganization. Um, we had two teen services librarians and Elise Bodell is um, in this meeting and she and um, her colleague Sandra Rosa have done yeoman's work to um, create a strong service to people serving all of the teens throughout the county. Wow, that needed to change. So we increased by 400%. We call them the Mighty Nine um, and they're doing phenomenal work. Um, we were able to invest about a million and a half dollars um, within our department so that we would have the capacity to engage outside of the community. Um, each of the job descriptions um, have been written with a customer at the center and customer meaning folks that don't even use the library, those who have cards, but especially those who don't. So trying to um, create some strategies for um, letting people know that the library is a, a strong safety net. It's a safe place. It's a place where, um, where they belong. Um, we have two strong pathways for um, being able to get in, to get promoted in the library that didn't exist. And so as someone who has a master's degree or not, um, there's a real um, clear pathway for advancement. And I'm really excited about the five new leadership positions that were required or that were, were created. And several of those was really important as we bargained um, this reorganization for over two years, that we were able to um, hold positions that don't require an MLS, that workforce doesn't mean, we have a workforce develop, economic development coordinator, doesn't need to have a library background, needs to know people. Um, I've listed a handful of resources there that um, helped to guide me as I was um, working with our labor team and supervisors throughout our, our reorganization. Um, I will just kind of point out the Workforce um, Force of the Future report from 2014 was a real catalyst for um, helping advance our digital literacy strategies. Hi, so I'm gonna walk y'all through um, Pierce County Library's racial equity call to action. Where we started, where we fumbled, and where we're at now. So this slide shows some of the questions we asked ourselves along the way. So in June 2020, the library, along with many other organizations, made a public statement following the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police. And it indicated the library's commitment to be a leader in helping end systemic racism. The message had a wide impact, <laughs> um, both positive and negative to our staff and the public. Um, it's important to note that the library system has been around for 75 years and has always taken a neutral position in its public communications. So this was a really big deal. Um, immediately after this followed, um, internal messages started popping up on like a staff message board, um, which showed the many diverse views of our staff. Um, and it was important immediately that we started engaging in what this looked like for us. Many of the staff in public asked, okay, well, what are you gonna do about it, right? What's your plan? Um, great question. So we spun up very quickly to figure out what the heck our plan was. Um, so the way we address kind of things that pop up is through this framework called a critical incident. So we use that framework in order to really work through the next steps in order to allocate resources and communication. So, um, the way we did it first was asking for feedback. And so one of the first things we did was create small virtual groups, one-on-ones, team meetings, and created a survey where folks could remain anonymous to give their feedback. Um, what we got back was overwhelming. <laughs> it took us weeks to go through it. Um, but what came out of it was some really rich next steps. Um, and so the committee of leadership members made some recommendations both for the staff and for the leadership team to provide feedback on. Um, these recommendations were the leadership team needs to have some big picture conversation to specify what does DEI and anti-racism look like in a public library, specifically at Pierce County Library System. Um, 
another recommendation was that we should do a uh, cultural assessment um, through a protocol for cultural to responsive organizations to really understand we, where we are at as an organization. Um, and this team needs to be cross-department, cross-classification um, to make sure we're fully represented in terms of who's looking at the organization and uh, grading us, basically. Um, the other recommendation is we need to get a DEI consultant in here to help us create a multi-year plan. Um, we knew we were coming up at the end of that five-year diversity um, strategic plan, and we're ready to dive into some more specifics moving forward. Um, and then last was training. It's obvious that we need some additional training for staff on all levels, um, and that we need to create some additional supports for BIPOC staff immediately. And so we provided these recommendations, and we asked for feedback, both from the leadership team and from um, staff. And as we keep very common thing. We heard lots of feedback, both spanning and supportive. And, but what about this? You need to do more, 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 or this works for us. So it was a very um, diverse feedback from both the staff and the leadership team. Um, it was a real challenge, right? Is we, a lot of us were really, really passionate about it and figuring out how do we find some actionable steps forward um, knowing that once we brought that consultant in, we would really nail down kind of the next steps and where we're going in the organization. So we collaborated, we came to some initial agreement, and um, we moved forward with the plan. Um, I do want to note that while we're working through this um, process, the leadership team and the board of trustees were both having separate meetings committing to moving racial equity work forward and allocating, right, the money, the resources, and the time to do so. Um, so since then, we, we have completed most of those recommendations, and we've also started our work with um, our DEI consultant. Right now, we're working on leadership team readiness, and then we'll dive into um, a DEI strategic plan for the organization. And I will say as someone that participated in most of those groups for from writing the RFQ to the critical incident team um, to being part of the leadership team, it was really hard. And there were many times where my personal opinion might have not aligned with the recommendation that came out because I might have thought it needed to go another way. And I think for me, it was standing in my own truth, making sure we're moving together as an organization, making sure people's voices are heard along the way and knowing that there will always be a time in which we will make sure those voices keep being incorporated so that we will get there. Um, and I'm proud that I was part of that. Um, and I'm also really looking forward to the progress that the organization is gonna make over the next year as we work through this plan and for the years to come as we start implementing it. Yeah. And just how, how we're going to implement it, it's with a key intentionality. Um, as Christina said, libraries have often taken a neutral position. And so as an industry, it's it's absolutely in the throes of a paradigm shift. Um, and I'm really excited to see how, how this moves. Um, continuous improvement as well. So I've just pulled out um, this gorgeous vision statement that was crafted by um, our teen services staff. And when we were building out teen services into um, the mighty nine, one of the things that became aware of is that this vision statement existed and nobody quite knew except those that were in the sphere. And so we wanted to, um, we took a look at it as leadership and teen services kind of made it a little bit more current and made it much more available to supervisors and staff to understand the body of work. And so um, this is about connecting um, service to impact. Um, and each of our teams, as we do project work at this time, they're um, chartering EDI efforts within every charter. Every ounce of energy the library is um, putting into, into service um, will have an EDI component. And like Christina said, um, probably the most important thing is to get that leadership commitment um, underway. So um, they've got, we have a mission to provide equitable team centered library services and resources to all members of the community. Um, 
and that teens thrive when they're supported by trusted adults. Um, and, and that's a really big point to, that I wanted to call into because not all library staff like working with teens. Um, and so part of our, our responsibility now is to ensure that there's really, really good service commitments and, and aptitude in serving the teens that are hopefully going to start coming into building after, after we're able to reopen from COVID. Last thing I wanted to mention is that in our programs and services, um, really being intentional about EDI work. Um, we did the last Pierce County Reads that I participated in, we were able to bring um, two great authors um, and an illustrator, author and illustrator for the graphic novel series, March. Um, that stretched readers in the county. Lots of adults haven't read graphic novels, but it actually represented one of the most diverse audiences that we've ever had in our 10 years of doing a countywide reading program. And just a, a pitch, if you're out and about in, in the county, you can find um, a story walk, um, a bilingual story walk featuring the big umbrella um, in about 21 communities. Um, it's a really nice way of getting out and seeing um, how helpful um, that big umbrella can be. So thank you. I'll introduce Cherise Gamble from Lister Elementary now. Hello team, I am so excited to be here. It's nice to meet you. This is my first time joining you. Just a little bit about me. Um, my early work was in business and child and family therapy, which led me to education, which then led me to mentorship programs, equity work and consulting, which is where we are today. Um, I really enjoy building systems. I really enjoy building community. And I really enjoy seeing how reframing how we think about K-12 education is able to create opportunities for our families, our students, and our communities to thrive. So I'm excited to share with you today a little bit about the journey of equity in schools and the way we are reframing schools to fit Black and Brown families and other marginalized communities. Next slide, please. Okay, so I like to always begin with the table because this is the opportunity that we have to create for students and families at the center of the work that we do around DEI in our buildings. So the goal of schools is to be a hub of community and to be able to center the voices of our students and families with that diversity, equity, inclusion, and access so that we can build those tailored systems for students and families to meet their needs. Next slide. What we're gonna do today is dive into the journey of what that looks like. So the journey of reforming and restoring traditional K-12 education. I want you to notice here how the cycle continues. So it's not something that stops, right? We continue to do that self-reflection. We continue to learn about the history foundations, new practices, and then we continue to move into that action phase. I also want you to notice the power of our language as K-12 educators and how we translate our thoughts into the words we choose to use and how those words create a narrative for our students and families. And if that narrative is a narrative that uplifts them or does not. So in the self-reflection phase for educators, what we're really trying to focus on is our identity and our bias and how that shows up within our practice as educators and how we communicate with and view students and families. And then that's how we learn to be able to interrupt ourselves so we can show up in culturally responsive ways. The next part of our journey is really challenging our thoughts on everything we've learned about American history, everything we've learned in our um, education to be educators of what that traditional K-12 model looks like and how students and families should fit into that model. Then we move into action. So after we've learned all of those foundational pieces, we move into the action of how do we center those voices of our students and families and community? And then how do we create and implement equitable practices that they need? Next, please.
So the reason why we begin with the self-reflection and the identity work is because that's not something that K-12 educators are offered in their collegiate practice. So it's really important that we focus in, on the identity because that's the way that individuals view themselves and that's how we end up viewing our students. So the way the world sees them and then those characteristics that defined us. Within American society, we know that those norms that you identify either give you power or privilege. So when we are able to understand that, we're able to understand how that shows up in our classroom. And then we're able to create that space that we're looking for. Let's go to the next slide. Again, with the self-reflection work, we see how implicit bias continues to lead to that structural racism that we see within the K-12 education. So we really need to focus on how we show up in doing that internal work first. We know that those dominant narratives coupled with the structure of the system of power continue to lead to racism, continue to lead to our students not feeling welcomed in their spaces. And that's why we want that journey for teachers within the DEI scope to begin with that self-reflection piece and that really intentional identity work. Next slide, please. The second piece of the journey for educators is really challenging our thoughts around K-12 education and the history that we learned within that system. So if you reflect on what you learned in history class in K-12 education, as we continue our journey as DEI consultants and community members and other community um, you know, systems doing this work, we really realized that there was a lot of gaps within our learning. And those gaps lead to us not understanding the systems, how and why they were created, and then how, and how our role um, shows up within those systems. So learning the history not taught in K-12 education is about learning how our systems and norms started, right? And those long-term impacts that they have for students. When we're thinking about the opportunity gap, when we're thinking about how students of color are disciplined at disproportionate rates, when we're thinking about graduation rates and who are our students that are completing K-12 education, we need to that those systems were created long before us, but we have a role within them and we have a unique opportunity to be able to disrupt those systems. So this is where that PD starts. This is where we begin our professional development. This is where we begin to do those team book studies, build our resource library. This was the foundational work for being able to interrupt the system that we operate within. So we know that our system within education has these inequities already in their structure, and we still operate under this system. So we need to be able to understand them in order to be able to interrupt them. When we all have that basic understanding of how we operate within the system, we are able to interrupt things that do not bring that diversity, equity, and inclusion to our students and families. Next slide, please. Do we get oh, perfect? There's just a little lag on my end. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So again. And what we're doing within Lister and many bu buildings with, throughout the district is those learning foundations to be able to interrupt for students. So this phase of learning is about being able to strengthen connections that we know our students, especially those students from marginalized backgrounds, lack and deserve. So social emotional learning, restorative practices, and then culturally responsive teaching. It's really about setting that focus of we build math and reading and all of uh, these other disciplines into our master schedule and we set the intention to teach our students these things and it's important that we set that same intention to build these skills that they will need throughout their lifetimes. So th this is how we disrupt the school to prison pipeline. This is how we break those norms of who shows up and which voices are valued. So within CELL, we are really building that foundation for academics. What are students' basic needs that they need to be able to even show up to learning? 
we're working on building student self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and then social emotional rec uh, regulation. How do they build that self-love to be able to show up to learning and then throughout their lives? The second piece is respect restorative practices. So how do we build that conflict resolution for students and families? How do we repair harm? How do we build community connections? And then how do we restore relationships whenever harm has occurred? It's about reframing how we view conflict. So versus seeing students, you know, need for attention, we see students need for connection. And how do we connect students to our school community? So really teaching students that background knowledge of how do we have community circles where each student's voice is valued? How do we have that powerful community involvement within our teaching and within our classrooms? So culturally responsive teaching really is about building teachers' cultural confidence and competence to show up for students. We draw on students culture to shape curriculum, instruction. We're bringing real world issues into our classroom. We're recognizing our community assets and being able to collaborate with families and local communities to bring them into this work and know that they are stakeholders within the K-12 education system and within our buildings. Next slide. And then all of that foundational work leads us into the action. So what you see here is the way we view our equity work. So system-wide, what are those things that we need at every level? How are we developing social emotional capacity? How are we building relationships with community? How are we centering voices and creating welcoming spaces? Tier two is the targeted intervention. So when we see a gap, how are we creating those small groups and those targeted interventions to fill those gaps within students' learning? And then tier three is really about restoring, restoring community. So when students have been out of school for any amount of time, how do we intentionally re-engage them in their learning and in our space? So when we think about tier three students, so students that are disproportionately affected by discipline policies, we see that those are students from our marginalized communities. So it's really, really important that we focus here on restoring community and disrupting that school to prison pipeline for students. The first step to action for us and for buildings is to center families and students' voices so that we can build the systems that they need for their basic needs and for their future goals. So this looks like um, building needs assessment surveys, having community forums, having roundtables with parents, and really being able to center community voice at the middle of our action planning steps. We built a racial justice team, developed our mission, vision, and values, and then we move on to how do we build outcome goals based off what data we received from students, families, and communities. I think the most exciting um, part of this work is the outcome and progress that we've been able to make across multiple buildings, districts, and K-12. The data says that our culture and climate has positively increased for students, families, and staff. So we are creating that inclusivity that we're looking for. We also see a lot of other positive um, trends in the data. So in 2018, when students were asked if they felt like they had someone in their community outside of their friends and families that cared about your future, 38% of students said yes. And in 2021, 89% of students answered yes. So that's a direct reflection of that community integration work and building that capacity for community to meet us in the classroom. Discipline data across all those buildings also shows that the frequency of incidents and exclusions has decreased over 60%. That means that, that we're learning to interrupt ourselves, our thoughts, it's that true history in the CRT foundations that's leading us to be able to show up for our students and allowing them to be in the building where we need them to be able to provide that education. The goal here is just to create those spaces and opportunities 
for families and ourselves to realize that that beauty that we're looking for already exists within our communities and every community has assets. And if we are able to find out what our community assets are, we can amplify them. And then we get to show our students and our families that they don't have to run from those communities that they love because we are able to build them. And we also are standing right behind them as they continue this journey. So that is a little bit about the work and the action. Um, and I'm excited to hear more from the rest of our crew and then answer some questions at the end. Thank you, Sharice, for um, giving us some background on uh, equity work in the education system. I think it's safe, safe to say that every organization, whether public, education, and or government, whether brand new or 150 years young, all foster a culture. And it doesn't have to be acknowledged to exist, but it must be nurtured to thrive, to empower their employees, and to have it contribute to the company's goals, growth, and longevity. If your organization doesn't currently have a defined culture, that's totally okay. You will get there. And if it does, just remember that there's always room for improvement. And before I go any further into this presentation, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge our teammate Delia Flores, who is here in the audience today. She has contributed to much of this presentation. And even though she's not presenting with us, she's definitely a part of our team. And we felt that it was important to acknowledge her because her voice is represented today. Next slide. Please. So our, our topic today is promotion. And, and you've heard us come at it from really different angles. It's so important because promoting DEAI work within the organization is the lever of change that creates organizational culture shift. And so promoting this work is the pathway for organizational culture change because it reinforces desired behaviors and discourages undesired practices. So all the things, all the things we've been talking about today are based in this understanding that we're not here to tell you what to do. I'm not interested in being a DEI consultant that acts like an equity enforcement personnel. I do this work because my well-being is wrapped up in yours. Delia Courtney and I were furloughed because of COVID for a few months of 2020. It was because our agency, like a lot of other agencies, took some immediate steps to respond to COVID-19. But the three of us were brought back early because leadership recognized they needed us to create some strategic pathways that hadn't existed before COVID. Our outreach team came back before many of the operations teams at their parks department because it was that important to our leadership. And when we returned to work, we were faced with a significant challenge, a kind of mission impossible to increase access to the conversation about parks priorities without gathering in groups or in person at all. Moreover, each of us is here today, having lived personal impacts of the struggle for social justice. And we knew we would have opportunities to put meat on the bones of our efforts to be an anti-racist agency in the wake of George Floyd's murder. So in promoting our work for inclusive procurement, which is what I've been doing since we got back, I've become aware that our organizational culture is shifting. You can switch to the next slide, please. We started referring to this as cultural renovation. So I'm gonna explain to you a couple of the shifting attitudes that I've noticed um, internally as I've been able to promote some of the benefits of our DEI work and how we're realizing that we have this kind of internalized aspects of the dominant culture. And that's a, that's a culture that's marked by competition perfectionism, false dichotomies, paternalism. Well, this year, things started to change and I've been invited into a full-time position to take on contract equity and inclusive procurement 
And this project has become evidence of the changing culture at our agency. I, I'm chosen to draw attention to the four statements you see here um, because they're the next steps we're, we're taking so that we can walk the talk. The recent shifts in my position and the organization's response to the work that Courtney, Delia, and I are doing, it, the work we're all doing, is an important case study as we learn what it means to be an anti-racist agency. So I'm going to say it out loud because these are things that I can claim to be true. We no longer allow ourselves to neglect hyperlocal priorities, even if the regional codes do not directly apply. We no longer expect perfection when we make attempts to change our systems. We no longer see competing priorities as a barrier, rather an opportunity to prove in all the areas. And we no longer hold minority voices in competition with the majority as is common default for government agencies in a democratic context. I mean, what I mean is you cannot say that you're about minority and women-owned business enterprise if you're always gonna let the majority rule, right? So I'll give you a practical example. You look at our staff configuration and you'll see a pretty typical parks agency configuration. But if you disaggregate the data that our human resources has been collecting, you'll see how rare it is for Metro Parks to hire people of color for full-time positions or promote us or retain us. You may know that I include myself as a person of color. And if you're wondering how someone who looks the way I do is a person of color, is because I, I have Caucasian and Basque heritage mixed with indigenous heritage from Mexico. Being a person of color doesn't require that I have more melanized skin. Rather, I know I'm a person of color because of my ethnic heritage and lived experience. Put it simply, I came to understand that I'm treated as a person of color because of my behaviors and beliefs that do not allow me to have an insider's perspective or relationship to the dominant culture that's preoccupied with skin color. Now, honestly, I cannot ever know what every person of color experiences. I can only confess that my experience is the source of my passion for the work that I do with people who do not have access to the resources that exist for me through our agency. So in our commitments to anti-racist practices, Metro Parks has chosen to track the truth about our agency's biases in this area. And I support the disaggregation of our workforce by offering up of our workforce data by offering up a certain amount of personal information so that I'm viewed as a particular part of the whole. Now this allows us to track the agency in meeting our goal of employing a workforce that represents the population and priorities of our service area. Now, I'm fully aware, most of my superiors are fully aware that this poses a risk to me personally and professionally, but I take on the risk of self-identifying as a Latina because I choose to use my privileges, my white skin, my master's degree, just to name two of many. And I use these to support others who've told me about their needs for access to employment. The agency invited me to self-identify so that human resources can track the length of my employment, the length of my part-time status, my unique configuration of qualifications and the type of work that I do in service to the greater good for all of our employees and candidates. And my superiors can act to promote me or retain me, knowing the burden and privilege that I carry. And what's more, I get to track opportunities within the organization, like the one to obtain a certification as a diversity consultant or an opportunity for translation compensation, because these make the most of my cultural identity. And we all work together to watch when I become eligible for these opportunities, when I have a chance to meet a performance goal that was set with my cultural expertise in mind. In some ways, by promoting me, Metro Parks is promoting equity. Next slide, please. So I'm going to elaborate a little more around cultural renovation. There's a podcast that I listened to by Kevin Oaks with Brene Brown that discusses the term cultural renovation. 
They talked about it in a way that made so much sense to me with the metaphor as renovating a culture is like renovating a beautiful historical old house. There are so many things that are foundational to an organization, foundational to the historical house that makes it what it is. And it's about knowing what to keep and what to change and also the why. Cultural renovation will face some resistance, but it's often necessary. It is renovation after all. It's about an upgrade. We're going to take this house that was built in the 1920s and we're gonna bring it up to date, up to code. We will keep what is special about our traditions, our culture, and what is special to us, but we will also be able to up the Wi-Fi and we will be able to turn on the lights. Building on this work that leads to a shift in organizational culture, renovation, policies and procedure is critical. And as an organization, it's so important that you not only do the work internally, but that you show externally that when you achieve workplace inclusiveness, it's a stronger workplace environment for all. And lastly, acting up on the opportunity based on the drastic impacts of social injustice and COVID-19, it's important for leaders to understand that we're all being presented with an opportunity to rise to the challenge and reopen your doors as stronger organizations. Next slide, please. Around the world, senior level leaders are very concerned about issues connected to diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. Everyone's trying to figure it out right now. However, many do not understand that, cultural, that culture, innovation, engagement, relationships, operational excellence, and leadership are all tied to an organization's equity and inclusion practices. It's up to the leaders to set, guide, and be responsible for the trajectory of the organizations that they serve. Good, bad, or indifferent, the leaders have the positional power to decide how their organization will respond, pivot, and, and move through this tumultuous time. Now is the time for leaders to carefully explore and answer some critical questions that will set the tone and direction for their organizations in the future. An equitable approach to this dynamic is definitely possible. And if when an executive share the burden of communication, risk assessment, emotional intelligence, and when they can provide clear, consistent guidance in writing and verbal commitments. Next slide. So at Metro Parks, we have elected commissioners who are responsible for representing the concerns of constituents. And then our executives listen to these directives and policies that will abide by local and national standards. So when a policy is approved, subject matter experts interpret the policies and develop programs and real properties in order to support the actions outlined in these policies. We codify promotion of DEAI to improve accountability. One type of response to the policies we have in place has been to study internal effectiveness and public priorities. The most recent of these studies began when, even before we entered into COVID incident command structure. The formal assessment of organizational structure and internal operations and systems and culture it took our incident command structure abilities into consideration and held us to a higher standard. So our pandemic response, even though it's not sustainable, it taught us how to activate in a new way. And it caused everyone to question where we become more efficient, more nimble, why we had not prioritized our most vulnerable populations in the past. In short, we realized we can respond to the deadly threat of a virus we could also respond to the deadly threat of racism. It's probable that we didn't realize that we didn't have sufficient mandate to promote or codify the promotion of the DEAI focused components that were already in our vision, mission and value statements. So in response to the heightened levels of social unrest and PT Metro Parks drew up a resolution just like many other agencies and corporations in order to promote their commitment, our commitment to this work. So we're still working on the practical application of the resolution. We're discussing and promoting certain elements such as actionable commitments, verbiage for accountability in our work plans and deliverables, and reminding everybody that 
this is a long-term stated goal. And I'm putting these here so that you can hold us accountable to these resolutions and these behaviors that we adopt as a result. So in some ways, I'm promoting it here too, so that you can see how we aim to promote it internally. Our resolution will be meaningless bureaucracy unless we can hone in on executing the daily tasks and resolve to improve interactions each individual employee takes on. Policies, assessments, programs are going to continue to be evidence of our implicit bias unless each person who works with and for our agency has made a personal commitment to the stated values and anti-racist resolution. And that will cause our organizational culture to continue to shift. Courtney is gonna speak now on how to build a more positive organizational culture. There are a lot of steps you can take to improve relationships and foster growth. Many impactful changes are small and occur at the granular level. These changes are typically quicker and cheaper to enact than large scale shifts. And the small changes, they can be organized into two categories. This is not too overcomplicated, okay? Relationship building and opportunity giving. Next slide, please. So if you think about it, promoting culture boils down to one fundamental necessity. Straight up, leadership must walk the walk. When employees see and hear you embodying those values, practices, and beliefs that you've established as a leader, they are more than likely to buy in. A culture that places a prominent focus on wellness not only empowers and encourages their employees to continuously make healthy behavioral choices, but it also shows your employees that you're committed to them and invested to them as individuals. Second, growing off your culture. A culture that shows where you are now is really important and it doesn't have to be a perfect system. In fact, there's no such thing as a perfect system and I wish that everyone would understand that. This work takes time and it takes a lot of commitment. It takes building strategies that leadership have to commit to, to redefine what the culture will look like moving forward. Provide meaning. It's important for internal staff to understand the why. Why are you committed to this work? And what does it mean to be an accountable organization that actually wants to reshift their culture? Does your staff understand why you're moving this way? Have you even educated your staff on the internal goals so that the organization can be focused on the shift in culture? Creating goals is vital for growth and measurement. State clearly to staff what the end goal is. If everyone is on the same page, you have a higher chance of success because everyone has commit committed to reaching it. Ask your staff what their individual goals are and see how you can leverage that to make sense to the organization's starting point. Encourage positivity. It's so important to ensure that your staff feel encouraged. Feeding the soul of your employees not only benefits the community in the long run, the work environment you're building belongs to your employees and they will be directly affected by every decision made every day of the week. When employees feel a part of the process, especially really impactful ones, they're more than likely to feel invested in your company and become more engaged. And the more engaged the employees are at work, the less likely they are to leave, have turnover rates, which ultimately impacts a company's bottom line. Here's a fun fact. It costs employers 33% of the worker's annual salary to hire a replacement if that worker leaves. Foster social connections. Building social connections in the workplace doesn't have to mean that all employees should be best friends or better yet, that everyone gets along all the time. It's just not realistic. But it's about fostering an environment that supports mutual respect within, trust, and belonging among peers. If you're a leader, you not only have the power to strengthen your own connections, but to foster a work environment that values instead of hinders social investment. And lastly, listen. It is so important, and I cannot stress this enough, it is so important to listen to your employees. Listening by itself has a positive effect on engagement as it provides a feedback channel and it shows employees that their voice is relevant. It also empowers them and the end result of empowerment and promotion within shows a lot. The term listening should by no means be taken literally. It's an analogy that compromises any kind of activity that intends to capture relevant input from potential, current, or even for former employees. 
This input helps the organization to better understand the employee's standpoints, opinions, and yes, their motivations. There's a wide range of data sources and formats to tap into, such as interviews, surveys, participation data, process data, unsolicited feedback posted on external websites, or typical KPIs such as attrition, just to name a few of them. A listening strategy is a deliberately planned and orchestrated approach to obtain relevant insights from or about your employees. And we understand that it may be just the beginning of the journey for many of you. And again, that's totally okay. Please feel free to contact anyone that presented today for uh, more information. If you have any questions, need additional support, or just simply need resources. And now I'm going to pass the torch over to Lawrence as he will share and close out with us with authentic equity versus artificial equity. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so this is the conclusion of our series. And I'm gonna ask that everyone who's listening, who's watching right now, um, to take note of the action that's being asked right now. There's two forms of how equity is moving within our organizations. It is an artificial equity that is happening and there's an authentic equity. Hopefully we are able to, distract, um, to display through this And then finally, only then can we actually have meaningful promotion. Promotion meaning communication to the public externally and then communication internally about what's happening. See, the key operative word we're talking about, congruency. Is there a level of congruency of what is being shared out there to what is happening in here? And how do we authenticate whether or not this is congruent or not? We ask those who have been most impacted by these harmful policies and practices if this is working. And if we're not doing that, we're on the other side of the equation. This is artificial equity. This is where people are making statements. These are where people are uh, posting images and doing all these things out there that when you take a peek within the organization, nothing is changing or very little. And so here's the ask. The next time you see a post, the next time you hear someone wanting a statement, ask them, is this statement reflective of what is actually happening within your organization? Because if it's not, this is bait and switch and we don't need it in this space. And let me say it more specifically and clearly about the, the magnitude of why. It dawned on me recently that the reason why this has become such a meaningful moment is because lives were lost. All of a sudden, some people woke up and said, oh, wow, racism is a thing now. Because people died on camera. So we don't have any room for playing around. We don't have room for virtue signaling to make it seem like you're something that you're not. So before we start doing messaging and communication about what we want to appear to be, let's do the internal work and have the internal drive and commitment and accountability to ensuring that we are walking the talk. So when you see it, you ask it. Thank you. Wow. Can we just um, sit in that for a minute? Wow. Wow. 
This chat is on fire. Um, I just need y'all to just sit in there for a minute. I don't know about you, but I just need to sit in it for a minute. So just take a moment and take a deep breath. That right there was, it was deep. It was insightful. It was a perspective angle or vantage point that I don't think many of us are seeing because we're seeing it. You know, you have these overarching themes and these broad topics and the broad words and spaces. That was amazing. That was amazing. Wow. So, Jeff? Yes, I'm here. Are we about to go into, are we going to go into breakout rooms? Or are we staying right here? No, oh, let's go to breakout rooms. We have about 20, 25 minutes um, and we have them ready to go. Okay. So some of you will stay in the lobby with us. Some of you will go into breakout rooms. When you go into breakout rooms, what is the instruction? What are they doing in the breakout rooms? We will have some questions, um, really just trying to understand, you know, what kind of promotion are you doing internally? Um, uh, Courtney and I have some questions. We're going to try and put those in the chat. I'm not able to change my screen, so I'm, I'm hoping we can post that in there. But really just how are you measuring it? Um, where is your organization at? Um, have you started? Do you want to start? Really just trying to understand that those types of questions and, and go from there. Okay, so if either you or Courtney can post the questions in the chat so everybody can get them. Yep. Um, hopefully you were able to capture what Jeff just said. And this is just all about perspective. What are you doing? How are you doing? You know, it's almost like reverse engineering. What's the difference? And I mean, that last slide between Authentic, authentic equity and artificial equity, bait and switch. How do we make internal shifts? How do we repurpose, redes redesign and redefine? Oh my gosh. So think about that while you're in the breakout room. So we have a few people that are gonna stay in the lobby. We're gonna have our own deep conversation. You're gonna hang out with Tamara and I. And Jeff, you can go ahead and start um, shifting everybody into breakout rooms. And right after the breakout room session is done, you'll come back and we will close out. I was trying to take notes. <laughs> I was trying to take notes. Man, tomorrow, hey, everybody get off of music. Is this everyone that's hanging out with us in the lobby? Hey, I'm off mute. What's going on? What's up, mate? Hey, Arthur, Arthur, get that camera on, man. James Get that camera on, man. What's up with it, James? Talk to me. Hey, 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 we need, if you cut your camera on, that way we can see you also on on our live stream on Facebook. So please join us on camera if you can. Um, in the lobby today with Tamar and I and Jeff and I, we have Garrett Nyland. We have the amazing James Hughes. We have Bob Daniel. Daniel, and I believe he's representing um, University uh, of Phoenix. University of Phoenix, yes. Juliana Flanders is here, but and Arthur Dennis, who apparently is still going to ghost us and not get on this camera, but well, I look, know Shelly, the, Shelly, the you great know you Arthur my, Dennis. Hey, Shelly, Shelly, you my inspiration and my motivation. You, the, <laughs> hey, you everything. You everything. And I, we have I can't get on camera. Houston on here as well, <laughs> who is joining us in the lobby. So we're streaming live on Facebook, and so the moment in the lobby is where we are all. We're gonna we're gonna dive into this conversation, y'all. We have to talk about this presentation we just had. This was amazing. So um, uh, just know that if you're on camera, we can't see you streaming live if that's what you're comfortable with. But if not, I just want to turn it over. Um, I want to hear from you. James Hughes, kick it off. What are your thoughts about like the task force and these presentations, this series, these last part, these last series that we've been running as a task force for the lens and equity? Yeah, G give me one second. I'm going to move to a a separate room here because we got cartoons on in the background. Hold on. <laughs> okay, this is real, this is real life. 
Yeah, and, oh yeah, uh, this is real life. This is real life. This is, uh, this is real you know, life. It looks like uh, Bob must. He's. I think he called in, so I don't. I don't necessarily know if he's on screen, but um, I just want to give pause to that. So when you, you know, we've had this is the fourth part of our lens and equity series, and so mind blown. So let's let's talk about that. So we'll kick it off. We'll start with you, James, and then I'll just call on folks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there were two term, well, two phrases that really stood out to me. Um, you know, just kind of listening to the pre uh, presentations. One, Pierce County is pretty awesome, right? Like, first of all, we we kind of got it going on here in Pierce County. I'm actually really proud uh, to be from Pierce County and be working and living inside of Pierce County. But the second thing was humility. I think there was an underlining term of humility with each presentation of saying like, it's okay to be educated. Doesn't mean you know everything. It's okay to have experience. Doesn't mean you have all the wisdom. It's okay to listen. You will never ever like know everything from everyone and every point of view and every angle. But the the idea is to constantly be striving to reach, um, reach and listen to each each one, and reach and listen to the people around you, your organization, through your policies, through your practices, your processes and procedures. Um, but to approach it with that lens of humility, you know. Um, I, you know, even within my own team, my own organization, like these talks have really like forced me to check my emotional IQ, to check my own behaviors, to check my own like biases, um, how I, how I see people, how I see, um, you know, concerns, issues, how I want to listen to my employees and listen to the communities that we serve our customers. So I, I just think it's, it's just been like, it's like super enriching, like for sure, super enriching. So I'm, I'm very, very proud of uh, what's going on here in Pierce County, but like, I'm actually a little bit more excited to to be in the space of saying like, wow, James, you've got a lot more to learn, right? You've got a lot more to look into. Um, and that's an exciting thing. It's, it's not saying like I've arrived anywhere, but I feel like I can bring so much more when I dig deeper. Um, and they, that's what the, all these conversations were kind of forcing us to do. So it's been really good. Thank you so much. Well, let's go ahead and hear what, uh, is Arthur Dennis uh, with us, sir? Are you with us or did he walk away? Can't okay, so we're gonna go to Amanda since she's on here. Um, uh, Amanda, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Arthur Dennis after Amanda. So, over these last, we've been seeing Amanda over these, we've done these this four part lens and equity series. And how has this impacted you? What does this mean for you as you know, being a member, an active member of the task force? You've been involved, honey, and you are invested in this work. You have a bank account that runs over. So, talk to us about this, this experience. This has been phenomenal. I'm telling you, after almost every presentation, I'm practically crying. <laughs> like, it's, it inspires so much hope. You know, I had, I've always had a difficult time connecting with my community. Um, being homeless, and passed up, and just with the rougher crowd, and you know, it's seeing all the work that's being done and focusing on, you know, these historically underserved communities that I've constantly been a part of. And it's like, I mean, I've, I pulled myself out and got myself together, but now I just see it so much clearer. And it's like, I don't have to be all the one. All my people are about to come with me too, because we have such incredible you know, humans that are out here saying, no, this is not going to work. And this is how we fix it. And it's mm -hmm. time to sit down, listen, and put some action to it. I mean, it's inspiring and it's rejuvenating. And yeah. after every presentation, I'm just sitting here like, wow, oh my goodness. It's, it's a good thing these um, end during the baby's nap time, because I don't even think I could feed her while I'm just taking all this in. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's so empowering. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I mean, and we just thank you and, and everyone who's just been so invested in this work. Um, when, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like going into the unknown in a crazy way, but there's Arthur Dennis. All right now, sir. So, you know, the question we've had for this amazing four part series of of great, oh my goodness, intentional information. As a member of this task force, 
for a while. You've been present here working with us. How has the, how's this, how's this sitting with you? What has this meant for you? You're on mute, Arthur. For me, man, it's fitting in a way where it's making it more, it's, it's, it's be, it was always a comfortable environment to be with. The leadership has always been great. The goals has always been clear in terms of why we're here to collectively share our values and expectations of what we're doing in the communities to basically dehumanize the experiences that the clients are, um, are having interfacing with a lot of um, the CBOs and, and, and organizations out there. Um, the message today was just really clear is that there's an amplification in terms of being serious about basically establishing uh, racial equality across all organizations, all service lines. And for that, there's no longer the, the um, I would say, there's nowhere to hide today. There's nowhere to hide today. You can't say that you're not, you, you can't say, um, I, I don't know who was just speaking right now, but I really appreciate that because that was on my mind. I don't know if that person was a person of color or, or um, uh, uh, I don't even like saying the word white, right? So I don't, you know, we need a new word for that one as well. I hope we get to a space where we can just call ourselves Americans and we can just lead us along and just really truly be just that, you know, just get past mm -hmm. the whole racial piece itself. So we don't have to distinguish amongst our ethnic, our, our ethnic background. But for the person that just spoke, you know, it was like, it became clear to me now. It's clear to me now. And that kind of like substantiate the reality that you can't, we can't run away from protecting privileges and, and practices anymore. Policies have to essentially be fair and, 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 and equitable. And for our students in the juvenile justice system, you know, I think mm. what I like for them is to see equitable application of sentencing, right? And mm -hmm. punitive punitive manners and, and uh, whatever in terms of what they're receiving in terms for concealing a weapon but not firing it against someone that don't look like them concealing a weapon and not firing it just because and both are concealing those weapons and I'm just saying using weapons because most of our kids most of our youth if you look at YouTube you look at anything a lot of our youth are really going to jail for jail crimes but I mean gun crimes but just to be short just to be clear you always had it right from the beginning. I think that the consistency in terms of pushing the message has basically created a situation where we no longer can hide behind our ideas without sharing those ideas because it's going to come out in your practice. And if it doesn't come out where it's basically promoting what is basically being taught, shared, mm -hmm. and learned, mm -hmm. you're going mm -hmm. to be called on it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate it. <laughs> And we have uh, Mr. Bob Daniel. I know you're on the phone, sir. Uh, do you, and I know you've only been with us for a short while, but for where you have from, from the moment in time that you have been with us listening to our different um, Lens and Equity series uh, as a member of the task force, how has it resonated with you, sir? And, and how, um, how do you, what your perspective on change uh, from where you sit? He's not muted, so I don't know if we lost him or not. Okay, so we'll just shift over to the amazing Zakora Banks. Thank you, Mrs. Banks, for joining us. Yes. <laughs> I'm just gonna assume if we were either gonna get you or Dr. Deshaun Banks, we were gonna get one of you. <laughs> so talk to us uh, while we're waiting on Bob to try to come back online. I don't know tomorrow if you could message him or anything to see if he can hear us. But uh, yes, yeah, so talk to us, same question. You've been a member a viable member of the task force since the beginning. Yeah. And so we would love to hear from you over this, these last few series, our four part series, what's resonating with you? Um, how do you see change happening from where you sit? Um, uh, you know, what does this mean? Yeah, what really resonate, resonates with me is really the power in the collective, the amplification of the messaging, and then just the practical ways to apply that to your organization, knowing that, you know, for, some, like, I don't know um, everyone here maybe, but I work in the financial industry. I work for a credit union. Um, and so with that being said, that's, you know, one system, right, that is deeply rooted in racism and has been, you know, from redlining to policies to access to um, really just 
um, being able to build wealth, right? It's been a a gatekeeper in that way. And so hearing how different organizations are doing things, hearing how different industries are applying DEI, um, Mm -hmm. for me, it's helpful. It's really helpful in the way on how I can, you know, continue to shift and grow my lens Mm -hmm. and how we're working. And so, um, I think really that's the best part. A lot of times you hear, oh yeah, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. But then there's not necessarily this, like how to apply in steps, how to apply in action. Here are resources. We've curated that all. It's a very, very um, like DEI overall. There's just so much that can be done and it can be overwhelming. It can be Mm -hmm. something that you're like, there is so much to take on. The more that you learn, you're like, okay, I got my internal biases, right? You know, I know there's other other um, things that need to be done in that way with my own personal growth, but from an organizational standpoint, like there's so much that needs to be tackled from, you know, a humanity standpoint, there's so much that needs to be tackled. And so it's helpful to be in a collective and really, um, you know, talk through what that looks like, a space that is safe to learn and not necessarily feel judged. Sometimes what I'll, I'll say my challenges are as a black woman, um, especially in corporate America, it's hard not sometimes to have animosity towards people, right? And, and not provide the grace because I'm like, come on now, like everything's out there. You should know, mm-hmm. right? You should know where you're at in your journey. You, sh- you should, you should take ownership in that. It's about humanity, right? Like at the end right. of the day. Um, so when racism continues to happen, it's like, all right, Zakora, you know, just take a moment and maybe it's just having a conversation with somebody to really see where they're at and their experiences too. So. Wow, that's powerful. Definitely powerful. Well, I want to reach over to Juliana. Juliana Flanders, thank you for joining us on camera. Um, you've been a part of this, of course, you know, you're internal to Workforce Central and you've been a, a, a gift like no other. How is this uh, lens of equity, lens and equity series, you know, how's it hit you? Um, what perspective do you have on it? Your thoughts? It's actually been a very unique experience for me coming as a younger white woman. I, it's not really subject matter that I've had to think about. It's not something that I've come into a lot of contact with from where I was raised, from yeah. how I've grown up. So it's been very eye opening to go through the entire series and to speak with some of the speakers about their well, I guess listening to their speakers and seeing their content about the experiences. um, It's just, it's been a very eye-opening experience to see that it's not just in certain areas. It's not just in certain sectors. It is a worldwide problem. It's a a cross sector problem. And it's something that we all have to address together. And I do appreciate how, how much experience, how much effort has gone into all of this series. You can tell that this is a passion for everybody who's spoken at all of the pieces of our series. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just been an amazing event. Well, it looks like we have some folks jumping in and and, 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 uh, starting to come back in, but Tamar and Jeff will get me if I don't allow them to say something in this moment. So, you know, since we started this, Tamar, Jeff, uh, both of you, you know, this Lens and Equity series has been a passion project for everyone involved, and it really has meant a lot. It is really kind of, I say, it has leveled the playing field on clarity. Um, it has also created a space for others to gain knowledge and awareness, access to that knowledge. So the two of you both, you know, jump in and talk to us about what does this mean for you as the leaders of this ep- effort? Um, since this task force is uh, powered by Workforce Central as a part of the Workforce Development Board, what does this mean for our work and how do you kind of see us moving forward? Um, real quick, before I go, um, I'm gonna kick it over back over to Kat real quick. She wanted to jump be in the lobby with okay, us from the beginning. On, so I just wanna let her talk real quick before me and Jeff go at it. How you doing? Welcome Kat. Hi, thank you, Shelly. So like you said, wow, like I can't write, have shared enough, you know, um, about what I, what I heard today in the messaging I got to share with the other group who were talking about, you know, what, what the progress they've made in their organizations, you know, and I'm here as a community member and a mother of, of, of children who are mixed, you know, in, with indigenous Puerto Rican and black um, heritage. And so it, listening to it from the the perspective of as a mother and also as somebody who belongs to an organization that serves people 
the message to me today that really stood out was, you know, about listening and it's different, you know, um, ways we get to listen, you know, and where we get our feedback from. But I wanted to share that that last message on congruency, right? And I see that that applies not only as how we look at our organizational changes, but how we need to look in ourselves and in our spirits as to what does this look like? What is the congruency and the feedback that I'm seeking um, and how I perceive myself and how others perceive me? You know, am I really doing and saying and being the person that I want to be? For my communities, for my organization, and for my family. So thank you for those messages today. Um, and the other takeaway was when you work in an organization that serves people, those spaces belong to those people. And wow. that will help us when we look at it from that perspective, that helps us change everything that helps us come to that space where silos are torn down and we get to come together and really look at who are we serving? Because this belongs to them, not us. So thank you for those, those learnings today for me. You're welcome. It looks like Zakora, you raised your hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's an icon up, so I didn't want to miss it. Okay. So Jeff, Tamar, back. Thank you so much for that, Kat. Oh, man. Um, you know, today for me was really enlightening. I know um, Sharice was speaking and she said something that really just triggered for me when we talk about wraparound services and what that support looked like. And she said, rebuilding competence and confidence. And that, that just triggered me in a way where I was like, oh, wow, you know, just making sure that, you know, you've taken care of the whole person. And you know, it's something that Jeff and I, we, we always talk about is taking care of the whole person. This group talks about taking care of the whole person. And what does that look like? You know, and um, Kat brought it up and said, you know, when we're in those spaces, the spaces are for the people. And, you know, I want to take that away for me personally today is, uh, you know, this is their space. The work that we're doing isn't for us. You know, any one of us that are in this group, we celebrate wins together. We all get these wins. And this series has been amazing. I've learned every month. I've taken away something every month, you know, and I personally just want to get better, you know, and the better that I am, the better that I can support every last one of you guys. So, you know, for the leadership to the presenters, you know, thank you guys for just the time that you guys have put into this. You know, this is a voluntary moment for us. And this is, we do this because we love this and we do it because of the passion that we have for this community. So I'm going to go ahead and take away the fact that me being able to personally grow in this group with you guys has professionally made me better. Yes. Yes. Jeff. Man, you know, the, the one thing that stuck out to me and it just keeps playing in my mind is when Courtney said it starts with leadership. And I think that's been a, a pretty consistent message throughout the whole thing. And I think we did a really good job of outlining how to do that, how to start that work, right? And the importance of it and why we need it. Um, just as somebody that has, you know, I have my own staff at, at another business, right? And, and just knowing that, and it resonates with me because we're the ones that help create the culture. We're the ones that put the things in place for that stuff to thrive, you know? And if, and if your culture isn't one of, allowing your employees to be creative and to have energy and to help that culture thrive, mm -hmm. then you're not doing it right. Um, and, and, and all of that said, like, I just think so many people forget that when they move through the ranks and they go through management and they become leaders, they forget who, who now their clients are, right? Mm. Your clients are your staff. Your staff's clients is the community. So if you're not taking care of your staff, what are you doing? You know? And so I just think some, cause that's not something that's taught. And I think so many people forget that, that as you move through the ranks, mm -hmm. your clients change. And so just really focusing internally and making sure that your staff knows the goals, knows, you know, the mission, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's just something that really resonated with me when she said, cause she said it so well, it starts with leadership. So. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that this presentation didn't highlight was the fact that we're all leaders. It doesn't take the executive director or the CEO of an organization to start this conversation, 
to keep this conversation going. If you have leadership qualities or you feel that you're a leader, keep the conversation going. We all have mm -hmm. those skills. We all have those, those talents. So it's up to us to keep those conversations going and to build that leadership within our colleagues so that they feel empowered to keep the conversation going. A conversation that we just had in our breakout room was that we don't talk about this. Com this these conversations don't happen at the lower level. And mm -hmm. so how do we keep conversations flowing throughout the organization, not just at the executive cabinet meetings, but when we're having our all staff meeting, how do we prioritize these conversations so that everyone feels included and that their voice matters? Because I guarantee you, if you ask your part-time staff or even your interns, if they have any voice around equity, diversity, access, and inclusion, they will all have something to say. They have to feel empowered. It's up to our leadership, which is us, all, everyone on this call, to keep those conversations going and empower our colleagues as we feel empowered. That's amazing, Courtney. And it is a great way to kind of bring us all back in for everyone who's coming back into the lobby. Uh, we appreciate um, those nuggets that have been dropped. Uh, and so, you know, when we think about all of the presentations in this Lens in Equity series, first of all, I just want us to give a round of applause to all of the presenters across the last four months, all of your hard work, celebrate yourself, celebrate one another, celebrate the work. It is a lot to ask you to be invested in something and you have to be able to connect to the vision. And not only do you have to be able to connect to the vision, there has to be purpose behind it. And once you saw the value in it and what this is meant to do uh, and what the Workforce Development Board in, Board's intention was behind uh, making sure that we had space for it to happen, then it, you just, you, it can be, it's unstoppable. So we're already in motion, we've been in motion and then this just leveled it up uh, uh, just to, to another level. So we appreciate each and every one of you who, and we hope that the investment in time that you actually made into this, that outwardly, when you take it out, you take it out and you activate and you're using everything that you're getting from these moments, that you're connecting, that you're networking, that you're collaborating in, in as many ways as you can, um, being a part of the Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force powered by Workforce Central. We just want to make sure that that is what's happening, but we also want to celebrate the learning that we have all um, been able to have happen for us uh, over the last few months, especially with intention. Um, so we're getting ready to wrap up and I just wanna let uh, Jeff then Tamar close, it up, close us out and then I'll close us out and uh, we'll be done for the month of May. Jeff. Thank you. I don't have anything extra to add. I just wanna echo the, the gratitude and just thank you for all four teams, the work, the presentations, the, the authentic, just putting it out there. Um, thank you. Tamar? And um, man, this last four months has been amazing. You know, if we was playing pickup basketball, I'd be like, hey, let's run that back. You know, it, it was just fire. Let's run that back. But, um, you know, for this whole team, for this group, for this family, I appreciate every last one of you guys. As Courtney said it best, we are all leaders in our own way, but we become superheroes when we collaborate with each other. It's like the Justice League in a way. But um, you guys are just amazing at what you guys do every day for this community. This community is definitely blessed to have all of us aboard doing things and all recognizing that we may not all be service providers, but we are a part of this community. We all have something to give. Always remember that. Lean on us when you need us, and we will always lean on you guys. Accountability is everything, and collaboration is the new inclusion. So let's go. All right, so once again, we just thank you for being here. There's so many ways to collaborate. There's so many community efforts going on. Please make sure that if you want that shared out or you want Jeff to use it in his email when he follows up with um, the updates and things like that, shoot it to Jeff Wolf so that way he can get it back out. I know he can pull things out of the chat later when we go back through and look at this recording. Uh, we wanna make sure that whatever we do, things start to get woven into our DNA. The DNA that it resides within us physically, the DNA where we reside, where we work, where we live, we need to start getting it woven into our DNA. So it, the conversation must happen from the ground up, from the top down laterally, 
there is no space where these conversations can no longer live. They have to live, they have to thrive. Common conversation, challenging conversations, conversations where we're holding one another accountable. That's what's important. That's, what's, that's what matters. So we look forward to seeing you again in June where we will be bringing another presentation for you. You'll hear about that in the next few weeks coming up. We have some great presenters coming up in June. Once again, this has been an amazing opportunity for us to connect and learn together. We appreciate you. We appreciate you like none other. And we want you to make sure that you stay, health, stay, stay healthy, stay safe, and most importantly, be kind to one another. Just love one another. Have a great month of May and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you.